This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. The latest ag news and the voice of Georgia farmers. It's who we are and it's what we do. Hi again, everybody. So glad you tuned in for another edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. Hey, you like apples? Well, how about them apples? Coming up, the Monitor travels to Blue Ridge, Georgia to see how this popular orchard continues to change with the times. Also on the program, she once thought cooking for six governors was the ultimate job. It was then, but nowadays, Georgia-grown executive chef Holly Shute has even more responsibilities and she is loving every minute of it. Plus, the Monitor sits down with UGA Associate Dean of Extension Laura Perry Johnson. How a lifetime of Georgia agriculture has led her also landing her dream job. These stories and so much more starting right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Well, this time of year, folks in Georgia and the surrounding states love to load up the car and hit the hills of North Georgia for apple picking season. Destination, Blue Ridge and Ella J, home to some of the best apple orchards in the country. And one orchard that always seems to draw a large crowd is Mercier Orchards, a Blue Ridge tradition that is changing with the times. As the years go by, the trees get bigger and the landscape more beautiful, or so it seems. A typical weekend at Mercier's includes plenty of family bonding and lots and lots of indulgence. And for owner Tim Rasier, each apple season in Blue Ridge brings more joy than the previous one. We've been in this for about 75 years. Uh, I'm the oldest one of the group that's left. Uh, my parents preceded me and uh, they got it all started back in about 1943. I have two son-in-laws and a daughter that are very much involved in the operation today. Uh, where we used to be primarily just a wholesale producer of fruit and shipped it all over. We've now moved to where we're more into agritourism, uh, direct farm marketing. Uh, we have expanded our farm market to where it's not just fruit as it used to be. We now make pies and we have a bakery. We do a farm winery. Uh, we have uh, all kinds of marketable items here in the store. Uh, just about anything you would want to look for. Uh, more doodads, as I call them now, than I ever thought we'd ever be in in a farm. But uh, as we go longer and longer into the business, we find there are more and more things you have to do to stay viable. And in order to stay viable, Mercier realizes that building relations within the community is a top priority. One way they're building those relations is by bringing the customer to the farm. Agriculture, so many people are so uh, removed from the farm today that they really don't know all the things that are going on. And by bringing folks here through agritourism to come on the farm to actually go out and you pick fruit, it gives us a chance to show people how things are really done on the farm, how we grow the product. They get to see us, so there's a credibility there. They know who is growing their product. In today's age, we think that's very important for people to know where their food is coming from. And by coming to the farm and visiting us, they're gonna see right where it's done. But gone are the days when Mercier was just a seasonal operation. As Tim puts it, the farm is dabbling in a little bit of everything. For instance, they're now producing their own hard cider using waste from their U-Pick operation. And arguably, one of their biggest ventures to date distribution of apples to Georgia school systems. We hope to be able to uh, further value add our crop by taking certain size of apples uh, that would not be able to be used in certain other ventures and take those apples and slice them and put them into packaging that the schools can use as a, a single serving fruit. The apple will be a first quality apple. It'll just be, we'll be able to slice a size of apple that normally you don't get into the store with, but this way we can slice it and take the slices and put it out in the single service. Well, the 
Well, by now, you may have noticed that Georgia cotton producers are starting to head out to the fields and harvest their 2016 crop. Recently, the monitor's Mark Wildman traveled to southeast Georgia to get a look at the crop and to hear about the challenges farmers have faced this growing season. In Baxley, three generations of the Branch family were out in the cotton fields on the very first day of the 2016 cotton harvest. This family and many other farm families look forward every year to the day they can finally begin to harvest the fields they have spent so much time working in during the growing season. The crop looks pretty good, uh, which we have some dry weather problems. And uh, this cotton where we stand is pretty good cotton, but uh, four miles down the road we got some that really done without rain and, and uh, not real good. But, but most overall, I think we're going to be pretty good shape. Cotton has been a struggle this year, but this farm is dedicated to growing the crop. It's normally about a third of our acres and uh, something we've been growing for a long time and it's, it's our best dry weather crop that we have for dry land. And uh, the only bad thing now is the price is so low, it just kind of makes it hard to grow and make a profit. The farm relies heavily on UGA Extension and Appling County Extension agent Shane Curry. We've had a, a lot of fields that look really good. We have uh, also a, a fair amount of fields that the hot dry conditions we had through June, July and even on into August has impacted it tremendously and ultimately that will have a big impact on the on the yield as we move into harvest season. UGA Extension provides unbiased information to growers that helps them get the best results possible for a crop that is very important to the local economy. In Appling County alone normally we're somewhere around 30,000 acres of cotton that we grow. We uh, also have two cotton gins here in the county, so it's a, it's a huge crop that we grow across our county. At the beginning of the season, of course, it comes down to variety selection. Once the cotton's planted, it's uh, usually it's different things, problems they see, could be diseases, could be insect pressure, it could be fertility things going on. So a lot of different things we'll talk about, might be weed control questions, all sorts of things that, along those lines that I'll help them with that they may have questions on. The Branch Family Farm has been in continuous operation for many generations and has seen many changes. And as the youngest generation takes over, the love of farming stays strong, even though cotton prices are weak. I grew up on the farm, that's all I ever wanted to do. And uh, now that I'm doing it, it's great. Uh, I wouldn't want to do nothing else. With lower prices and high input cost comes the need to produce high yields and the need to keep the cotton picker running and productive. The technology has come a long way even since, you know, since I've been around it. Uh, I got a cotton picker now that I can pick cotton right by myself and used to it took, you know, three to four people. Uh, I like it, but, uh, you know, it, it's costly. Definitely without yield, it's, it's hard to continue to stay in business it's hard to, to get everything that, it's hard to pay for everything to continue farming on into the, the next few years. Just breaking even will only get you by for so long. Reporting from Appling County, I'm Mark Wildman for the Georgia Farm Monitor. Thank you, Mark. So what was it like cooking meals and entertaining for six Georgia governors? When we come back, the Monitor sits down with Georgia grown senior executive chef, Holly Shute. Plus, her love of agriculture has led to her involvement in 4-H, FFA, and now UGA Extension. Our one-on-one -on -one interview with Laura Perry Johnson when the Georgia Farm Monitor continues. Hi, I'm Holly Shute. I am the senior Georgia Grown Executive Chef with the Department of Agriculture. I thought I had the best job in the world. I was the Executive Chef at the Georgia Governor's Mansion for the past six administrations. It was a lot of fun. Um, it was very different. Starting out with Governor George Busby, things were very formal. We, had, uh, we were responsible for three meals a day, seven days a week. We had uh, butlers and everything was served on silver service. As the years went on and things got more casual, we would just leave dinner on the stove at the end of the day for the family. So things over the years definitely got more casual. I loved the, I loved the entertaining. I loved when we had foreign heads of state and people that they were trying to attract to locate their businesses here in Georgia and just showing them 
the wonderful products that we have here in the state and why they should come here and locate their businesses here. The creation of the Food Network has really gotten people more interested in cooking. And then the whole farm to table movement has become, it's not going anywhere. People realize that the food that they get closer to home is so much fresher uh, and better for you that it, they become interested in finding out where their food comes from and how to use products that are available close to their home. It started out, um, you know, the, the commissioner kind of reinvented it uh, about five years ago and since then it has done nothing but grow. We have incredible artisans um, creating products from pecan oil to um, all Georgia Olive Farms olive oil. Uh, we have incredible jams and jellies and all kinds of sauces and seasonings and just whatever your imagination can create, we've got artisans here doing it in the state. It really is wonderful. I feel like my wings have been clipped. I just, I'm having the time of my life. I get to be out in the public with people and I get to use incredible products and show people how to use the wonderful products that are available here in the state. Um, it just really is the best job I could ever imagine. From Piney Wood Farms in Colquitt County to the Associate Dean of Extension at UGA, Laura Perry Johnson told us she knew at an early age that she wanted to be connected to agriculture and credit some important role models. Even though Laura Perry Johnson's father, longtime farmer Louis Perry, tried to get his daughter to pursue a career in teaching, she declined his suggestion and entered the UGA College of Ag and Environmental Sciences. One of the things that I found out is that I, I evidently have a very high level of tolerance for bureaucracy. So I am able to go in and deal with the policies and procedures and explain why that won't work for the people out in the ground, out on the ground delivering the programs and, you know, be a conduit to um, support those people who are out on the front line really doing the good work. So it's turned out that um, this ended up being a, a pretty good path for me. Johnson has served as livestock specialist with Georgia 4-H, the 4-H coordinator for the Southwest District, the district director, and less than two years ago named associate dean of extension. She says her life on the farm prepared her for those positions. I have had a tremendously supportive family. If it wasn't for my husband who is self-employed and has a more flexible schedule than I do, and my parents who live here on the farm, you know, it has been a team effort. Uh, my mom picked the kids up from school for years. My husband took them to school. And so um, that, that support has enabled me to be able to do what I've done. But what I tell young people coming into this field, whether they're male or female, is that, you know, you can have it all, you just can't have it all all the time. And so it's always a balance and, and you can't be 100% of everything. So, um, you know, there, there are times when I miss important functions with my, with my family. And there are times when I say, no, I can't schedule this work meeting at this time. So I, for me, it is a constant and ongoing struggle. I haven't found um, the magic bullet. I'm looking for that, if anyone knows what it is. And she attributes any success to her family and values that she learned on the farm. But my dad is the one that gave me the love for the land. I mean, his family has had this farm for generations. They settled this land in 1835. And um, my uh, grandmother, his mother, is, is one of the strongest female role models I've ever known. So she was so far ahead of her time. She was a teacher and she always told me, Laura, you need to be able to take care of yourself. It's okay to get married, but you need to be able to take care of yourself. My mom, you know, she would say, just take it one day at a time, give a good day's work for a good day's pay. And, and um, even today when I have challenges, I'll call her and talk to her because I know she's not going to tell anyone the confidential information. And she'll tell me, Laura, all you can do is the best you can do. And, you know, just keeps me going. So uh, they have been a very uh, strong influence in my life. Even though the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences is facing some challenges, Johnson believes the school can manage through any tough issues. 
I want to develop some capacity for extension. I want to develop a succession plan, and I want to leave this organization stronger than I found it. Um, I'm standing on the shoulders of many great people that came before me, you know, starting with Tal Dufal, who was the extension director when I was a little girl, and ending with Beverly Sparks, who had this job previous to me. But I want to be able to, um, to leave this organization better than I found it and, and hopefully do some good things while I'm here. Well, just a reminder, if you missed any part of the story or others on today's program, you can still see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel. That's the Georgia Farm Monitor. Once there, you can browse the archive of stories dating as far back as 2009. And once you're done watching your favorite stories, just keep clicking like the Georgia Fire Monitor Facebook page we have set up for you. If you have a story idea or if you just want to leave us a comment or suggestion, feel free. Send us a message either on Facebook or at the address you see there on the screen. That is news at farm-monitor.com. Now, meantime, U.S. agriculture is poised for substantial growth in the Cuban market, but financing restrictions are placing U.S. farmers and ranchers at a serious disadvantage in this nearby market. American Farm Bureau's Chad Smith has more. The House Agriculture Committee held a hearing to look into the possibilities of removing agricultural trade barriers with Cuba. American Farm Bureau Federation trade specialist Dave Salmonson said Farm Bureau sees a lot of opportunities for agriculture if trade with Cuba should open up in the future. We uh, did submit a statement urging uh, Congress having to take a hard look at some of the restrictions we're uh, dealing with and our agricultural trade opportunities with Cuba. And the hearing was uh, set up to investigate those and particularly look at issues of agricultural export financing. A limited exemption in the embargo was set up in 2000 to allow for agricultural goods to be sold in Cuba. However, the way financing the trade deals was set up makes it difficult for the U.S. to move products there consistently. There was a piece in there that said that there couldn't be any export credits offered, meaning Cuba has to pay cash. Well, that's put us in a bit of a competitive disadvantage over the years. Well, all the other countries of the world can allow uh, for credit sales, which is normal in trade. And so we're uh, certainly happy the House Agriculture Committee is taking a hard look at this. Salmonson said there are a lot of opportunities for agricultural trade in Cuba. Cuba imports over $2 billion worth of food and ag products every year for their 11 million people. Currently, uh, U.S. agriculture sells about $150, $160 million a year into those markets. And we had a high of a few years ago of almost $700 million. So we're, we're kind of falling uh, behind and uh, certainly behind our uh, major competitors. Farm Bureau says there's no better time to provide American farmers and agribusinesses the tools they need to expand agricultural imports into Cuba and help our industry survive this difficult economic environment. Chad Smith in Washington. When we come back, how residents of this community are doing good things for others by canning their own vegetables. From our friends in Tennessee comes the story of one community which has its own unique way of helping fruit and vegetable producers prepare their food for market or just store them for winter. You see, the town has its own cannery, which operates several days a week. Charles Denny shows us a busy morning at the cannery and how it benefits others. Plump, sweet tomatoes, a Lauderdale County specialty. But we can't eat all of these at once, so what do we do? Well, you've come to the right place, the community cannery in Ripley. Here folks can bring fresh produce in, along with their own jars, and the nice ladies like Mary Miles will assist you. Well, you can can about anything you want, you know, because we have the three pots for the canning and the cooking off, shelling the peas, we can shell just about any kind of peas. The cannery is open four mornings a week, about 20 total hours. It's free to any local resident and funded by the county. Harley Patterson loves Lauderdale tomatoes and comes in often. And at the cannery, he has the capacity to juice hundreds of pounds in minutes. What's nice about this is that we, you don't have to know a lot about canning. Uh, the ladies here don't do it for you, but they're right here and, and they help you every step of the way. Uh, and it's, uh, it's all you know, very sterile, very uh, clean, very commercial. 
but we have commercial uh, steamers here to sterilize jars. J.C. Dupree admits he's no canning expert, but he does lend a hand, especially in the areas of food safety. UT Extension has been involved in the operation here some four decades. Dupree says this facility is a true community resource where canning is done right and done quickly. No wonder it's such a popular place. And if you come out here on a Saturday sometimes, I've been out here and there's been 15 to 20 people and there's a waiting line uh, out this door uh, to come in and juice tomatoes. And that's exactly what's happening here this morning. The cannery will stay open into early fall. And if the people of Lauderdale County want to know if they can enjoy fresh vegetables in the coming winter months, oh yes you can. This is Charles Denny reporting. Finally today, with Georgia accounting for nearly half of all the peanut production in the United States, now is an important time for the industry as farmers around the state are beginning their harvests. Damon Jones tells you how the peanuts are currently looking and one major obstacle they had to overcome. Each and every year, farmers are at the mercy of Mother Nature during the growing season. And this year, she was not kind to peanut producers as there was not only a lack of rain, but also record high temperatures. We had a really a uh, hot uh, really hot temperatures in June and July, which I think took a toll on some of the crops. And uh, we don't we don't know how it's affected our yields yet. We haven't actually started harvesting peanuts yet, but we we, we think we might have a little bit of yield reduction because of the heat and uh, stress that it was under because of the drought. But just how much of an impact all the stress had on the crop is the real question. And so far, the early returns are somewhat inconclusive. For the most part, it's going to be a decent crop. It's not going to be a uh, excellent crop, but mainly that's just because of the drought that we've had. Uh, Pulaski and, and Bleckley and kind of South Houston has been one of the dry spots in in uh, South Georgia, so it's, it's been a rough year. Because of all the dry weather, a few adjustments had to be made during the growing season, and the biggest one of those was, of course, using more water. A lot more frequent irrigation because of the heat uh, to, to try to keep the ground cool enough to let the peanuts produce, so it, it was a lot more irrigation and a lot more frequently we had to because of the, uh, so many days over 95 degrees uh, just kept the ground so hot it was hard for the peanuts to, to really uh, pollinate and produce like it's supposed to. The drought not only had an impact on the growing conditions of the peanuts, it also presented another problem when it comes to pests. We, we got some insects, lesser corn stalk borers have been an issue. Um, pretty much any field in, in Pulaski you can find lessers. Um, even in our irrigated fields, kind of our dry corners will, will be pretty much infested with lesser corn stalk borer. If there was a silver lining to all the lack of rain, it did lessen the impact of diseases on this year's crop. Um, disease was not as big of an issue as it has been in previous years, mainly because it's dry. Um, we did hear some underground white mold problems that they had in South Georgia, but for the most part, we were, you know, we came out pretty good on that end. Despite all the setbacks, the harvest schedule has not been affected as farmers are out in their fields gathering up their crop right on time. Uh, things are going great. Uh, we've started plowing up our first uh, peanuts. Uh, we've been through a pretty uh, bad drought this year, so our, our dry corners, everything up out from under irrigation is not very good, but under the irrigation they look pretty good. Because of this, the most important recommendation for farmers as they begin their harvest would be? Uh, the number one piece of advice I would give is to make sure you kind of separate your your dry corners from your good irrigated peanuts. Um, the last thing that you would want to do is is mix those in a load and uh, have your good peanuts go seg two or seg three just because of those dry corners. So I would I would pick the dry corners first and uh, then move on to your good irrigated stuff. Reporting from Hawkinsville, I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. Damon, thank you so much. That is going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. A reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm, be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and the Farm Monitor Show. Take care, everybody. We will see you next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Have a fantastic week.